today we're going to look at on the subject of repentance, uh, but more uh, from the light of the verse 9 from 1 John chapter 1. Uh, so this is a verse which we're going to meditate. If we confess our sins, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Uh, but we will read all together in your Bible, from your Bibles. You may be muted, but you can read this passage uh, or with me and we can read all together. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This repentance subject when John was presenting, he had a context. There was a circumstances in which John was presenting this particular uh, instruction and he was teaching this repentance. Well, when he was trying to instruct the believers, saints, and uh, according to the history, he was far away from them. He was, there was a, a distance. He was probably uh, located at uh, the church at Ephesus. But believers to whom he was writing were scattered. There were saints, there were Jews, Jewish converts, and other mixed uh, people, but who have experienced the salvation. And they have started coming together as a church. And this church, because it is far away from the place where he is, has also got the mixture of groups, not only the Christians, but even those who are not Christians. And sometimes, if we care to read the whole book, not only the Christians, but even antichrists. And there were those who do not have the spirit of God, but totally a different spirit. Therefore, when he was addressing, though he says we, but he takes pains and he takes efforts uh, to distinguish who are his, who are really the ones who belong to the fellowship of God. And out of that, there are many things he is trying to speak in this book. Of many things which he is speaking in this book, one thing I think it will be such a good blessing, it will be a great blessing for us during these times to give ourselves to meditate a small book, a book like 1 John, or maybe a book like James, a book like Jude. If we give ourselves and sanctify ourselves as a whole book, we can understand the author and his intent and his circumstances. And this book has been such a great blessing for me in this season. And this message is coming uh, because this has been a great blessing in my, in my own life. And one other thing which he did, and it's such an encouragement for me as a pastor, is this. He is trying to alert his saints, alert people who are in the fellowship of the Antichrist are the people who deny the divinity of Christ, who deny the gospel of Christ. Gospel as such, he himself learned. John the Apostle, the way he learned, the truths he learned. And when he saw the people are opposing and fundamentally opposing to what he heard and learned from the very mouth of the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, when he came across some of the people who are denying those truths, Therefore, he did not hesitate to call them anti-Christ. They are not the followers of Christ. They are enemies of the Christ. And he goes so much so, tells that they were for some time fellowshipping with him. Now, this is something that is very interesting. Why it is very interesting? If it happened in the very first century, there is every possibility that it can happen after 2,000 years after the church has been established. And he says, at one point, there are many antichrists have come. If there was a possibility in the first century for many enemies of Christ, many, enemy, many enemies of the gospel can pop up, can appear, they can make their presence in the church. It will be foolishness to think 
for us as a pastors and much more as a church to think that there are not many now. And especially when we are surrounded by so many channels, so many YouTubes, so many pastors, especially when we are placed in a place like South India, when there are so many denominations, so many churches, John 1, 1 John becomes a rescue. That's a rescue boat which will deliver us from the storms which a Christian can face. Therefore, I welcome you, encourage you to enter into this first book, know this first book, by heart this first book, learn, completely uh, internalize this first book of John so that you may save your own soul. But not only that, if we care for our family members, if we care for our fellow believers in the church, it's very important to internalize this book in our lives. Anyway, coming back to this, there's another category of the people he's trying to picture uh, to the saints is another category of the people who have made their way into the church are liars. They are liars. They are not Christians. They do not have the Holy Spirit of God. They do not have gospel in their hearts. They have gospel on their lips. They have gospel in their tongue, but they do not have gospel in their hearts. And it takes all the pains to teach them, to instruct them, who are such people? What is their character? And that is the, another pain which it takes to tell the people, to tell the saints. In the fellowship when you gather, you must be mindful of the Antichrist, people who have false spirit, and at the same time, people who are liars. When I say liars, not I do not mean the Christians lying. Liars, when I say liars, they are not believers. Because he used the word liar to term or to distinguish the people who are not believers. So liars are those who do not have a truth or the gospel in, a, in them. Liars are those who do not have the Holy Spirit in them, but they have complete proper confession of any Christian, any proper Christian. Their language is Christian-like. Their confession, their, uh, their, their many professions are Christian-like. They preach Christian-like, but their heart does not have the gospel and truth. They are the liars. And it's quite a, uh, quite a task for every one of us to distinguish a person who's professing to be a Christian, to look into his heart, to understand from his heart whether he's Christian or not. To that, he gives us a help. He helps us to know, how can we know somebody who is true from the heart, true Christian from the heart? And when he does this, he also gives beautifully certain doctrines which helps us not only to check others, but to begin with us, to check others. Maybe by chance, I may be just the confessor, uh, a confessing Christian, but not the true Christian within. And therefore, it is for me. Let me introspect. And because it so beautifully gives this doctrine in the light of which I should recognize who is the liar, let me check whether I myself I'm a liar, whether I myself have any false spirit in me. And that is what we're going to do today. We may be very quick to change so-and-so person, but let's start with us. Let us introspect. It is, a uh, you know, we know this is famous saying, today is the day of salvation. But the people who are born again, it's nothing wrong to confirm today is a day of assurance of salvation. We can keep assuring our own salvation in the sense whether we are in the very warmth and in the light of God. Anyway, coming back to this point, what is he trying to say? This one point in verse 9, uh, which will help us to see how am I doing spiritually at the same time to see who is the liar and who is not the liar. Who is the true Christian and who is not the true Christian. And here comes, he says, if we confess our sins. I would rather put that as 
repentance, because in the context of it, when we look at confess here, if a better word to render or to give a proper meaning, and this is confess here means repentance, because definitely John, I don't think he's trying to say if we are only confessing with our lips, and we are not repenting of our sins. He will be foolish to say the God who is a righteous and just. He knows our hearts, whether we are having a mere confession of the lips or whether it is a true repentance of our heart. When in this verse, when he says, if we confess our sins, our God is a righteous and just. He's a righteous God. He knows whether your confession is true repentance or it's just the mere confession of it or mere saying of it but here the point and idea is repentance because even if we go to the chapter 2 verse 1 my dear little children I do not want you to commit sin but if in case anybody sins we have an advocate with God Lord Jesus Christ even when you take that is into the context it is not just a confession it's a repenting of sins not only chapter 2 verse 1 but chapter 1 verse 7 it says this if we walk in the light as he is in the light we fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our uncleanness this is a repentance especially when I walk I walk and the God continue to reveal the sin in me I repent over the sin. So the better word to use an, an a, a, a idea with John was saying repentance. Now coming back to, uh, let me sum it up uh, of what all I have said now. This is important. And he says, repentance is a true mark of a Christian. Repentance will help us to see where do we stand in our spiritual life. Repentance will also help us to distinguish who are the true believers and who are not the believers who are liars. Now, having said, having established this point, repentance, now I come to very interesting part and this is applicable for pastors. And I see if we confess our sins. I really like the term that John was using. If you look at when John, when he's writing the first chapter, he says, if we say that we fellowship with God and walk in darkness, he is identifying himself with other people. There we see the very posture of John. His posture is like a true genuine minister. He does not want to make all the people uncomfortable. And when especially is trying to emphasize the truth like repentance, he's identifying with others and he's saying, we confess. He's saying, even I am included in this, if we confess. And that's one point which we should really appreciate. John, especially in the chapter one, he does make a demarcation when he's addressing specific people in the chapter one, he tries to identify the people, though he may not have committed any sin but he's identifying, he's humbling himself. We see the similar uh, gesture, uh, even from the Daniel, when Daniel was interceding for Israelites, when he realizes 70, year, uh, 70 years of captivity has come to an end, he says, Lord, we have sinned. There's humbleness we see from the John. And the second thing is why is he doing? Is His ministry is to, Preach repentance. I would rather put this way. Ministry of the word in a simplified language in one sense is a ministry of preaching repentance. We preach repentance only through which the person is born again. Once the person is born again, we preach repentance because through the repentance, one is cleansed, one is sanctified. In other sense, a pastor is given very inconvenient and a difficult job of preaching repentance. And we do see that, uh, and uh, Paul uh, uh, stating that 
uh, you know, in Second Corinthians chapter seven, he says he begins to say, "My letter must have caused you to sorrow." You know, you, my letter must have caused you to sorrow. And at one in one sense, I think it will be very nice if we can read that. I'll share that screen with you. Just a moment. Uh, I'm sharing the screen. As it is, I rejoice not because you agree, but uh, because you are you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffer no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. We'll stop here. Now, we see he is, uh, his letter caused those people to sorrow. Now, that's not an easy word. Now, that's another way where we have to observe whether the people are truly the ministers of the word of God, what are they ministering? Are they ministering about God is all the means for all your happiness? That's a humanism. God is given to you for all your happiness. You lack a job, here is a God. You need a wife, here is a God. You need a husband, here is a God. We do not deny that. The God is indeed there as a heavenly father to meet our needs. But much more than that, if we reduce the truth to that, it is such a lesser truth that we are preaching from the gospel. We should be ashamed of ourselves. We are preaching the gospel, which is going to end with our death and which is going to end in our grave. That is not the gospel. The gospel is here, the repentance, the preacher of the repentance. We see that so evidently in the case of Apostle John, when in the Mark chapter one, when Mark is written, when, he's, when he has to talk about um, uh, John the Baptist, he says, John the Baptist came with this message, repent of your sins. In the same chapter, when he has to introduce Lord Jesus Christ, he comes with this message. I think first of all, first of many messages is again the Jesus Christ, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. The first sermon after the day of the Pentecost, the Peter says, and when the people are converted and come, dear brothers, what shall we do? Repent of your sins. Now you see, the gospel is not a bar. Oh, you come to the God, God will give you heaven. The God, you come to the God, God will deliver you from the weaknesses or sorriness. It's about repent of your sins. You needed to call the people to sorrow over their sins. That's the true, genuine uh, work, a uh, sign of the work of the Spirit of God when He's leading somebody to the experience of conversion. No, we cannot reduce, and John was doing that. But in the context here, he was talking to the people who were already Christian. Then the moment we have become a Christian, the repentance is a continuous act. We have to continue to act. Now, for, for what we are supposed to repent, and we know for sure, we are called to repent for the sins which we have committed. Now, we, we, even before I dive deep into this chapter one, I, you know, if somebody can read uh, Galatians chapter five, Galatians chapter five, I, I did not have a time to uh, copy paste the whole of the verses. But it will be very nice if somebody can help us to read chapter 5 and from verse 19, verse 19, 20, and 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This message cannot even, uh, cannot be more simpler than this. 
cannot be so categorical than this. Anyone who's practicing drunkenness will not enter into the kingdom of God. Anyone who is practicing, and you must care to look at some of the details of the sins which he gives. And he says, anybody who is practicing and continuing in the sins of strife and dissension, anger, jealousy, and he uh, even goes to the point of envying. And the list goes on. Just take some time on this evening. Go through these things and introspect. Lord, is there any sin in this which is in my heart that for which I needed to sorrow over? Over, I needed to repent over that sin. Just take moments. What is that you're struggling in your family? Are you struggling with a dissension and strife, maybe with your partner? Or dissension and strife within your own families? Or it may be happening in the church. When, uh, when, when Apostle Paul, when he has to write in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says that people, men, I wanted men all to lift up their holy hands and pray for all people without any dissension, without any anger. There can be anger issues in the church. There can be dissension issues in the church. He says, overcome them. Become holy, lift your holy hands and begin to pray. There can be a sins like the, as small as anger, sins like as small as dissension in the churches. Some of the words which we do, the gesture which we give, probably causing some kind of a dissension, some kind of a disturbance in the church. In fact, Ephesians chapter 5, if we care to read, uh, can, uh, can sister read verse 26, chapter 5 verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by uh, the word. Galatians chapter 5 verse 26. Ephesians or Galatians pastor? Galatians, sorry. Galatians chapter 5 verse 26. Let us not become conceited provoking one another, one another, envying one another. That is in the context of the church. Let us not be conceited. Let us not become boastful, provoking one another, envying one another. Let us take some time to introspect within our church. Am I behaving boastful? Am I behaving envious? Am I behaving uh, in, a, in a way of pride? You have a greater list of the sins one can introspect and repent over, confess over sin. And another test I would give it to you is that if you say, no, all of these ones I was able to overcome, none of these sins are not, in, uh, are, uh, uh, they are not in me, then this is the truth for you. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 7. Can somebody read, please? One John, one and five, right? Sir? Five. This is the message which which we have heard from him, and declare to you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And verse seven. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with oh, one so another. Verse six also, five and then six. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if if you walk... say, oh brother, this list of five, they are very primitive. I have overcome them and none of those sins are in me. I've just, I've got no uh, such kind of a sins in me. Then I have challenge for you. Verse five of 1 John chapter one, as God is holy, if I should walk in him, what's the holiness of God? That's the doctrine which the John was presenting. You are called to fellowship with a God in whom there is no darkness at all. And that's the highest calling which he is giving. The God does not have any darkness at all. He is in fact cannot be tempted according to James chapter 1. The sin cannot penetrate through him. That's the nature of God. How is Lord Jesus Christ so different from the prophets? How is Lord Jesus Christ so different from all the angels? How is Lord Jesus Christ so different from Adam? He is 
Sin cannot penetrate through him. If the Satan may try for 40 days, 40 nights, 40 years, for eternity to try to tempt Lord Jesus Christ, he cannot get through it because the sin cannot penetrate through Lord Jesus Christ because God cannot be tempted. That's the calling John was saying. He knows that we have weakness. We have a fallen nature. We still carry the Adam nature. But the calling is there that we must call as a God is holy. The God's holiness in book of Revelation, it says, holy, holy, holy. It is inscru it is in in inscrutable holiness. It is beyond our understanding. As the wisdom of God is cannot be comprehended, the holiness of God is beyond our imagination. The one song which we'll be singing after going into the heaven is to join with them, say, holy, holy, is because eternity is not sufficient to discover what is real righteousness and holiness of God. When I say that I fellowship with God, and the God as he's walking, he's showing, and one of the person he'll be showing is Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, 1 John chapter 2, he begins to disclose, uh, 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 instruct, if we walk as his son, Lord Jesus Christ as well. Now take time to meditate in the four Gospels, how Lord Jesus Christ lived, how he humbled himself, and there we see our hearts are exposed. Our sin is completely made blatant. It is visible. Brother and sister, let us not deceive if we say we have no sin. That's the crux of verse 8 and 9. The message he gives to the specific class of the people who begin to claim that we don't have sin. Verse 8. Can somebody read verse 8? 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That is very important. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Why do we deceive ourselves? Because the truth in you, we have no truth. Truth in you, which is the gospel which you have heard when you were born again, it is by nature continues to purify you, continues to show your sins, continue to show your ugliness. And it happens in the fellowship of the saints. Till I, you know, uh, I may think if I, before marriage, I must have thought to myself, I would give my love to my wife. In, 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 a, in, a, in an exceptional way, in an exponential way. I think you are not married yet. Once you begin to marry and once one or two or three years are gone, then you begin to say there is so much of shallowness. It's not that you love your wife, you love your own self. It's in the fellowship, the more of the corruption of your heart is discovered. You must not, must not have, must not, might not have completely understood the very institution of the marriage. It helps you to know the weaknesses and shortcomings which we have. Maybe you have not worked in the corporate or along with other people. When you begin to work with the people, anger issues, impatient issues, and issues when the people come with their sins and schemes, and they're trying to disturb you, trying to cause you, then you see how your heart reacts. There is strife issue, anger issue, disappointment issue, discouragement issues. My dear brothers and sisters, it is not time for us to play and think and deceive ourselves. The gospel is right in your heart. We'll keep telling you and uh, keep purifying you that there is a sin in us. It was so important for John to bring this to the notice. If we are born again, if we think that I heard the gospel and so and so date, I have lifted the hand, I have taken the card, therefore I'm perfected. There is no more sin in me, absolutely no more sin in me. Then you are deceiving. There is no truth in you. If you have heard the gospel, if you, the gospel is in your heart, one thing you will realize, the gospel will continue to purify. And in order to purify, it will show the sins in you. Verse 10. Can somebody read chapter 1 verse 10? If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar 
and his word is not in us we make god a liar the biggest sin which you will be connect, committing today is by saying that i have no sin because the sin which is charged to you is that you're making god a liar you see my dear brothers and sisters god does not take a joy in showing you the sins his job as a father the very epistle starts uh, with uh, addressing god as our father we have entered into the fellowship of our father father entered with us in fellowship along with his son lord jesus christ it all happened when i heard the gospel with this triune god with this godhead when i fellowship with him he takes the pains to show the sin not to condemn you but to purify you that's job he has taken on himself it is not a a big truth as a parents we do that with our children day in day out because that's a responsibility to purify my son to perfect my son to discipline my son and that's the whole story in book of hebrews chapter 7 when the hebrew is trained you are legitimate children therefore god disciplines you if he doesn't discipline you then you are not his child you're illegitimate that's the language the author of the hebrew uses God has taken upon himself to discipline to sanctify you don't make God a liar it's just a matter of the time how you introspect go to book of galatians and see the list of the sins if that is not sufficient go to the life of jesus christ scan through the gospels and know him in and out how he behaved and conducted himself if that is not sufficient go to the god know the god go and god god's nature and characteristics that's the step one that's the beginning point is to how i can be a holy you know the young people keep coming and say how can i be holy there are many solutions we can give many instruction we can give but one of the thing which i we should need to instruct or encourage those people know your god that very truth is sanctifying truth more i know about my god more i know about his glorious nature more i know about his spotless nature that it uh, that it happens the sanctification happens because the spirit of god jumps in the joy as the knowledge of the god it enters into you it begins to apply your heart begins to apply in your life transforms your life don't say that you have no sense and when we see the sin we are called to repent of our sins if we confess our sin and then the rest of the words is just worth gold and jewels why it says god is faithful and just you see the god will act out of his nature is a father is a righteous he's true to his word you you know to confess there is no sin that he cannot forgive and that's how the word says all our sins all our unrighteous can somebody take pains to read oh. chapter 1 verse 7 the last part and chapter 9 the last part John chapter one and uh, seven, Pastor. Seven, the last part. Yeah. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. From all sins, and verse nine, the last part. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sin, forgive us our sins. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness from all unrighteous what is your sin today name that you may can name that if that is a sin as as heinous as loathful as a sin of david uh 
sin of adultery, the Lord is willing to forgive. It may be as heinous and how grave sin as murder as a David has committed. The Lord is willing to forgive. Whatever may be the sin, uh, how many number of the sins you may have committed. But if you come to the Lord with a true repentance, he is true to his promise. He will forgive your sins. Remember, repentance has to be the genuine one. And you know how will you get this repentance? It is a repentance produced by God. And that's the point where the, uh, the, 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 Paul was trying to say in the second Chronicles 7, godly sorrowness takes you to repentance. It's not something you think about sin, you know, think about X, Y, Z, and you know, uh, the repercussion of it. It is true that we are called to think about it, but it is a time for you to go because if you realize the God who is author of this Bible, the God who sent his son, Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter one, verse 21, to save his people from, uh, from our sins, the God who has given the holy fellowship to you is constantly work in you of cleansing he is already convicting you of the sins because sometimes to satisfy you know that we met the tick mark for the repentance we just try to think what we have gone wrong that's a very shallow repentance i would say you know then you will only conclude few things it is like when wife and husband and sitting in a very uh, normal way and trying to confess each other's sins I think not until unless the God really intervenes and work at the hearts, we'll begin to confess the real things. It has to be godly sorrowness when I read the scriptures, when I see the beauty of God, when I see the sin and the sin is convicted and the word is convicted in me. It's a time to sit under the word of God and then confess and repent of our sins. Is a time that I spend in fellowship with God. And as the God begins to convict me of those sorrow, that godly sorrow which he brings, we need to tarry sometimes because our lives are so full of busy. We have so many things to worry about. The last thing we can be worrying about is repentance. But my dear brothers and sisters, repentance is important if you really want to have joy in your life. 1 John chapter 1 verse 4. Can somebody read 1 John chapter 1 verse 4? And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Why is he writing these truths? He is writing these truths and one of the reasons he is writing that your joy may be full. The sin in a Christian life is a joy robber. He's a thief. Of stealing your joy is a thief of stealing your peace and the only one way that you can get rid of these sins get rid of these sins from your heart is to come into the presence of God and repent because the God intend to make your joy full you can enjoy the fellowship of God when you turn away from the sins and turn towards the God that's the meaning of repentance the last and then we will close in the first point which i wanted to make you remember is that john was taking pains to tell repentance is a true characteristic of a christian for us and also to see in other people's life and it is a ministry of the minister it's a difficult job we there may not be really a joy we keep telling about the sins we keep charging you about the sins and the, and uh, and paul knows it and he says sometimes it really causes a sorrow sometimes i feel it's such an easy job to become a prosperity gospel um, preacher prosperity gospel preacher it is such an easy job to become a humanism pastor i can build a million dollar church well, I can give a competition to Tirupati as well, because that's the place people go to become rich. And I can say, here is a God better than the one who is sitting on the seven hills. Well, there is a better logic there to present. But my dear brothers and sisters, we are called to minister the sorrowness of God 
through the word, through the gospel, because that is a gateway for a joy to be complete in your lives. God is a just and faithful. Now, another trouble we have with repentance is people are not faithful. If we confess our sins, they are really harsh. They are not kind. They spread the word. They take the word. They will completely defame you, completely make a caricature of your character. But God is faithful. You go to him, whatever may be the sins you have committed, he is faithful and his heavenly father. And that is what he has to say in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, that's the love. I don't want any one of you to commit sin. I don't want you to be in sin. That's the endurance I'm taking to write this whole book of John. I don't want you to be a sin. But by any chance, if you have committed a sin, come to God. We have an advocate with Father. Who is this advocate this evening? This is a message for you. Whatever may be our sins are after you have discovered and the God's sorrowness is completely gripping your heart. Look to God and on the right side of the God, there's an advocate and the word used for him is paracleto, which is who is a helper who comes along with us. We got a helper in heaven with God and he's still doing the ministry. He's a high priestly ministry with the God in a better position, the God in a better state, in a glorified state, in an ascended state. God himself being the God is become an advocate for you only to see that you do not commit sin, only to intercede that you may have sins forgiven. How can we deny that love? How can we deny that plan of God? How can we reject that love of God? If you are a son, the first person you have to run to, he has provided the righteous advocate. If he sees the repentance is true, he's not advocate like we have an advocate. When you committed a sin and he knows the sin, then he becomes your advocate. No, he advocates for the person who's a true repenter. We got a righteous advocate. And look at the life of Jesus Christ. For you to be delivered from the power of the sin, he has come into this world to save you from the sins, to deliver you from the power of the sins. He died on the cross to deliver you and make you free from the ritual traditions and all the law he has crucified on the cross of Calvary. He was buried and he was resurrected so that you may be completely free from the power of the sin or the authority of the sin. That's the better way to put it. But now he has sent it, but he has not stopped. He's interceding for you that in case if you have committed a sin, that you may still stand pure and perfect in the presence of God. For he made the propitiation for all our sins in verse 2 of chapter 2 of 1 John. My dear brothers and sisters, what stops us to grow in repentance? What is hindering us? To acknowledge our sins. What is really stopping us to acknowledge our sin before our partner, before our children? They may be harsh, they may be kind, but remember your father is faithful and just to forgive you our sins. He won't stop there. He will cleanse you. He will help you to overcome their sins. If you learn to grow in repentance, in fact, you began to overcome the sins. You are an overcomer of the sins. One of the ways the Christian is overcomer of the sin, he has learned to repent over his sins. So let's take this time. Let's take a resolution, Lord. I want to be a repenter every time the sorrowness over the sin begins to connect, uh, convict my heart. I would love to look at the advocate you provided in your redemptive plan. He's seated right side of you. And help me not to hesitate. Help me that I may not delay. Rush and run like a David. Repent of my sin. From there comes a song like Psalms 51. Now, let's take a moment. How many of us have a psalm like a 51? 
may not be for such great as a sin, but every sin of which the Lord has enabled us to overcome. Let us have a song. Let us have a song. Let us make our joy full. Let us make a Christian journey a journey of psalms and hymns and songs. Not just we sing, but we repent and write our own life as a song. May God bless this word.